All right, welcome everybody to today's webinar. Uh, we're just going to give it to a couple minutes past the hour before we get started, let people trickle in that might have had meetings that ended at the top of the hour. All right, well, let's get started. Welcome to today's webinar on Microsoft Purview. My name is Matt Safer. I'm the data practice lead for Atmosera's professional services organization. You can find my contact information here on this slide and a number of the certificates that I've achieved through Microsoft and Databricks. Before we get into the content, I wanna tell you a little bit about our company, Atmosera and our core services. We have three main pillars within our organization. We have consulting or professional services. That's where I spend most of my time um, helping people either migrate to the cloud for the first time or enhance their existing um, cloud infrastructure. Uh, we also do custom software application development on Azure. Um, our specialties within consulting tend to be data, uh, DevOps, um, and application development. We also do instructor-led training and on-demand training. So we can do on-site training or virtual training. We also have a library of pre-recorded educational um, content if you're interested in that. The third pillar is our managed services and we are a Azure Gold partner and we have a number of um, gold competencies for an Azure expert MSP and also a GitHub verified partner. So before we get started, I wanna mention that this webinar is for people who have some familiarity with Azure already. Maybe they are um, a company that has used Azure before or just interested in Azure. Uh, maybe have some uh, of their data state built out already and are looking to add purview to it. Um, but some familiarity with Azure will be helpful, but not generally necessary. Uh, first, we're gonna cover what purview is and who it's for. We're gonna go over its core features and we'll touch on the preview features. We'll get into a little hands-on demo and we'll finish up with some Q&A. So if you have some Q&A, uh, if you have some questions, please feel free to ask them through the GoToWebinar interface. There's an, the ability to ask questions there, and I'll answer those at the end of the webinar. All right, so first, what is Microsoft Purview and why would we wanna use it? I'll start with Microsoft's definition. Microsoft Purview is a family of data governance, risk, and compliance solutions that can help your organization govern, protect, and manage your entire data estate. The modern uh, Microsoft Purview is actually a combination of 
the previous product, which was called Azure Purview, and the Microsoft, 300, Microsoft 365 compliance solutions. And that's what's depicted in the diagram. The green represents what was Azure Purview, and the yellow represents the Microsoft 365 component. Today, we're gonna to primarily talk about data governance on the Azure side of, the Microsoft, of Microsoft Preview. Um, but the side related to Microsoft 365 covers data related to Teams, SharePoint, OneDrive, Exchange, that, that type of data. So what is data governance? Uh, data governance is a principled approach to managing data during its life cycle from acquisition to use to disposal. Data governance has become pivotal as the value of data assets is, have increased. Uh, data governance is necessary to assure that data is safe, secure, private, usable, and in compliance with both internal and external data policies. We accomplish data governance today with Microsoft Purview using metadata or data about data. And we use that to understand our data estates. So it's important to know that Purview doesn't actually ingest any of our data or make copies of existing data. It just keeps up-to-date information about data and processes. By doing this, we can gain insights into how data is being used and who has access to it. Purview can help give us a bird's eye view into our data estate and address fragmentation or siloing of data. It can also address business semantics or how we talk about data across our organizations. Let's dig into Purview's core features. First, Purview is a platform as a service and it's built largely on top of the open source project called Apache Atlas. And because it's a platform as a service offering, you don't need to provision any hardware. You just need to spin up an account um, like you're used to provisioning resources in Azure right from the Azure portal. When a new Purview account is provisioned, you get the access to the governance portal. And that's what you're seeing here in the screenshot. Its user interface will be very familiar to you if you've already used Azure Synapse Studio. It has the blade style menu on the left where you can dig into the core features. The first feature I'll cover is called the data map. This is where you tell Purview about your data estate. You define and register your data sources. You organize your data into collections and classify your data here. We'll talk more about the data map on the next slide. The next core feature is the data catalog. Once Purview is aware of the data in your data estate, you can use the catalog to browse it. This is also where you can view your data's lineage. And that's where and how your data has moved throughout your data estate perhaps through cleansing or transformational processes. This is also where we can make our data more valuable for business users by setting up a business glossary and applying it to data. We also have search. You can see that in the center of the data catalog UI, but search is basically available on all interfaces within the governance portal. Lastly, we have data estate insights. This feature is purpose-built for governance stakeholders, those who are focused on compliance, data management, and data use. It provides actionable insights via drill-down capable dashboards. So if you're looking for a high-level dashboard view, this is a great place to start. These dashboards are broken up into three sections, namely health, inventory and ownership, and curation and governance. And if we have some time during the hands-on, I'll click through those dashboards so you can get a feel for what that looks like. So these are the core features that are generally available or GA within Microsoft Purview. I'll be getting into a bit more detail on the coming slides and in the demo, but as you can see from the image, there are a few blades that I didn't uh, talk to. And these are the features that are in preview. And so we'll get to those soon. Before we get to the preview features, let's dig a little bit more into the data map. The data map is really the foundation of Purview. It's where we define and register our data sources. And Purview supports basically all Azure data sources 
as well as many popular third-party data sources, such as Amazon's S3 buckets, HDFS sources, uh, Salesforce, Snowflake, Teradata, Salesforce, a lot of sources are supported. Once you've defined your sources, you can logically group them together into what are called hierarchical collections. And defining your collections thoughtfully is an important thing to do early because once you've registered your data sources with a collection, you can perform bulk actions and permissioning at the collection level. The data map is where data sources are scanned and through scanning, assets are identified and classified based on scanning criteria. These assets are at the high level databases or data lakes or little lower level tables or, or individual files. They can also be things related to process like Azure Data Factory pipelines or data flows. Basically, anything identified through scanning our data sources will be classified as an asset. There are default sets of scanning criteria for each data source. So if you're scanning a data lake, the scanner is looking for specific types of data. You also have the ability to set up your own custom scanners, and we'll look at that um, when we get it hands on. Beyond just identifying data assets from your sources, Purview also does automatic classification of those assets. Classification assigns unique logical tags to assets, which makes them easier to search, understand, and govern. As you can imagine, this can help with risk and compliance. An example would be automatically identifying all instances of passport numbers or social security numbers or some other PII. There are over 200 built-in system classifications, and there's also the ability to create your own custom classifiers. It's also important to note that classifiers can be applied at two levels. At the high level, they can be applied to the asset itself. They can also be applied a little bit lower level at the schema level, so to like individual columns. Sometimes the data map is referred to as the elastic data map. And that's related to the elastic nature of the operational throughput cost model. It uses a term called a capacity unit or CU. All accounts start with one CU by default. And with one CU, you get a throughput of 25 operations and 10 gigs of metadata storage. And that can elastically expand based on usage. So you don't need to manually scale up or down your account or your capacity units. That's taken care of based on usage. Another thing I haven't mentioned yet is with Purview, you have the ability to act not only via the governance portal, which we've seen in the screenshots here, but also programmatically via REST APIs. So if you prefer, you could set up your whole account using REST APIs, and you could also view uh, the results of your data state, uh, data governance solution using Purview in a completely roll your own uh, visualization solution that accesses the data that exists in Purview through the REST API. Now let's dig into the data catalog. The data catalog is where you can browse the assets Purview is aware of via the scans previously mentioned in the data map section. You can browse uh, by collection. And if you browse by collection, that again, that's the logically grouped data uh, that you've defined or you can browse by data source type. When viewing some assets, we have the ability to dis also discover their lineage. Data lineage is the visual representation into a, data's, in a, into a data asset's origin and how and where it moves throughout the data estate. This is great for backwards looking scenarios like troubleshooting or forward looking what if scenarios. Sometimes these are also called impact analysis. Purview currently supports varying level of automatic extraction of lineage information support depending on sources and processing engines. But there's also the ability to manually define lineage through the API if you'd like. Some parts of lineage are still in preview um, and we'll talk about that in the preview section and we'll also look at lineage in the demo. 
Another huge part of the data catalog and purview in general is the business glossary. And that's what I'm showing a screenshot of here. The business glossary provides consistent vocabulary for business users. It consists of business terms and how they relate to each other, as well as the assets in the catalog. Terms can be linked to assets at different scopes. So like you could link it at the table level or the database level or the column level. The glossary helps abstract technical jargon for business users and allows them to use terms they're familiar with. Every term in the glossary comes with eight built-in attributes. And these are things you'd expect a term to have. So the name of the term, the definition, you can define who's responsible for that term, like a steward, who knows the most about a term. You can define experts of the term. You can also define synonyms and acronyms of the term. And these eight built-in attributes are provided by what's called the system term template. But you also have the ability to create custom te term templates. And with these, <clears throat> this gives you the ability to use custom attributes. Templates also logically group terms. For example, you could create templates for a business unit, like HR. And then all HR terms could use that template. You can see in the screenshot, terms also have statuses associated with them. You can see some are in the approved state, some are in the draft state, some have an alert, and some are expired. This is useful in the life cycle of a glossary term. <clears throat> so now let's talk about the features that are in public preview. Preview features come with a caveat, uh, and that is that they don't have the same level of support as GA features and are subject to change, <clears throat> but they do give us the benefit of an idea of where Microsoft is taking purview and the ability to plan for and try out these features. So like I mentioned, data lineage, a lot of it is in GA but some new additions to Lineage that are in preview are Azure SQL DB, specifically stored procedures. So when you run a stored procedure that loads data from one table into another, it'll now show up in Lineage if you enable data lineage on your Azure SQL database uh, scan. Next, we have policies. These can be used to manage permissions and access to data systems across your data estate. So previously, if you wanted to manage permissions, this would have to be done at a resource by resource level using identity access management through the portal or through some other means. If you're familiar with the portal, you're probably familiar with RBAC roles and how you uh, assign those roles to individuals or groups through the portal. Now, with this feature, we can uh, we can provide access to our data all through purview. This feature can be combined with the next feature, workflows, to allow self-service data access. Workflows are another exciting new preview feature. An example of a data access request workflow is in the screenshot. And workflows allow repeatable business processes that can be created within the governance portal to validate and orchestrate, create, update, delete operations on data entities. So for instance, if a new uh, asset was found in a scan, that could trigger a workflow. And they could also be used for data access, like in the screenshot. Workflows use pre-established actions and are run or triggered when, a spe when specific operations occur in the data catalog. Another example of an action would be a new business glossary term is created. By default, this can kick off a workflow action that generates an approval request or notifies certain users. Workflows can be scoped at two levels, to data governance for access or data use management, or to the data catalog for the glossary. Pre-built workflow templates exist but they're also customizable. Uh, data sharing is another preview feature. This is also known as Azure Storage in-Place data sharing. 
This replaces the need to create more pipelines and incur the cost of additional storage and movement, not to mention delay, of sharing data with an external customer. This can be done at the file or folder level using blob storage or Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 2 and supports cross-tenant functionality. How this works is you, you identify a data source that you'd like to share in Azure Storage. You send an invite to somebody or some company that also uses Azure that you wanna share that data with. When they accept your invite, the consumer of the data specifies their own Azure storage account, and then the data is then replicated in near real time to their storage account. Um, so the consumer pays that storage in access charges. I think this is a really cool feature, and there's a lot of interesting use cases um, that this opens up. A couple more uh, minor uh, preview features that are available are sensitivity labeling, that's more related to the Microsoft 365 side of purview and is done through a different portal, the compliance portal, and is outside the scope of this webinar. Um, search relevance, basically they are uh, upgrading the algorithm uh, for searching within uh, the data catalog, so just improved search results. And then managed attributes is a new feature allowing you to create user-defined attributes and attribute groups that provide uh, business or organizational level context to assets. So more ways to tag data with attributes. All right, so let's get to the hands-on section here. All right, so here I'm showing you the Azure portal. Um, I'm looking at a resource group that I created for this demo. It's called RG Purview Demo 01. And we've got a number of resources in this resource group. We've got a key vault, we've got our purview account, we've got a data factory, a key vault, um, some networking resources, we've got a SQL database, um, we've got Synapse and some storage accounts. So we've got, you know, some things that would mimic an actual uh, environment. So once you've provisioned the purview account, it'll show up in the resource group that you deployed it to. You can then click on it like this and you can open the purview governance portal using this link here. I've already got it open, so I'm just going to move over to it here. And this is what you see in the uh, governance portal when you first, oops, I think I switched screens there for a second. I'll get that right back. This is what you see uh, when you first launch the governance portal. We have that blade style menu on the left here with the data map and data catalog that I talked to. We've got our data state insights. We've got some management. Um, so let's start here with the data map. Like I mentioned, this is the foundation of purview this is where you define and register your sources and within the data map in the sources tab we have this canvas here and this kind of shows a hierarchical view of the collections that are defined there's always a root collection and underneath that there can only be one root collection but underneath that root collection there could be many um, kind of child collections right now i only have one collection here it's defined as contoso and within that uh, collection, I have two data sources registered. One is a SQL database, and the other is an Azure Data Lake storage account. We can view collections in a different way here. If we go to collections, you can see we have the root collection and the Contoso collection. We've got some information on the uh, sources and assets here. We also have the ability to assign uh, roles and permissions at these collection levels. And you can see the path of the collection here as well, the number of assets and sources. If you wanted to register another uh, source, you'd use this register button here in the data map. 
So you can see there's a number of pre-built connectors, <clears throat> which make it easy to add a new or register a new data source. You can also use, um, for instance, I, I mentioned that I have a key vault in this storage account. So you can use, you can create credentials that reference that key vault as I did here for the SQL account. But let's look at these sources that I've already created. Um, so in the uh, in the data map here, another thing that I mentioned uh, is once you've registered your, your data sources, you have to scan them to find assets that exist in, inside of them. So just by the merit of adding data sources or registering data sources, we don't know, Purview doesn't know anything about the data that resides in them. <clears throat> so you have to scan, uh, the data sources individually, and you do so using this new scan button here. So we've already got some scans associated with these, so I'm not going to create a new scan, uh, but I'll show you what, if we were to make a new scan, what it would look like. Um, you can give your scan a name and specify the database, the credential to use to connect. I'm using a managed service identity. You can specify whether to use that lineage extraction, and again, this is the preview. Uh, feature associated with Azure SQL DB, and you can select the uh, collection to associate the scan with. So, um, and you can al you can also further refine the scan to scan a subset of the SQL database to only scan a certain number of tables. Um, and we'll look at we'll look at that here on the existing scans that I've created. So I've created two scans here. <clears throat> One. Um, this UOF one. This scans the entire database and it will, uh, I'm going to click this test connection here while I talk. This is a serverless SQL database and so kind of goes into a oh, like a warm spare mode uh, when not accessed for a certain amount of time. So this test connection will probably fail, but it'll it'll warm it right up for me. So we'll be able to take a look here in a second. But this scan is going to scan all um, of the uh, assets within the Azure SQL. <clears throat> um, it's not doing uh, lineage extraction. Let's see, this should fail here in a couple more seconds and then it will succeed the second time. Come on. Then you can see here when you're creating a scan, <clears throat> like I mentioned, you can scope your scan so you can specify specific tables or schemas that you're interested in scanning. In this case, everything's checked. And also, I haven't mentioned rule sets, but there's a number of rule sets and they have system default rule sets. In this case, we're going to use the system default rule set for SQL here. And then we set the uh, scan trigger. So I only wanted this scan to run once because this is a static database, nothing's really changing in it. But you could also set a schedule for your scans to run. Um, and it's a pretty robust schedule here, um, but we'll just keep it there. I'm going to cancel it here. Um, but that's what that scan did. It ran once on the 19th and it ingested 18 assets. Um, so let's look at the other scan here. This is the DHL scan. This one has lineage on. <clears throat> and what we can see here is a lot more runs. This scan has been run uh, incrementally. And that's what happens with a lineage extraction scan um, for SQL, is it needs to periodically scan the database to see if anything's changed uh, with those stored procedures that it's monitoring to extract that lineage uh, to stay up to date. So even though I did define this scan to only run once, the fact that I have lineage extraction on means that it will um, continue to run um, periodically 
And you can see here, I've scoped it down to just these two tables that I created for this demo, a source test and a destination test. And I've also created a stored procedure in between those two and use the default rule set. And I, even though I said once, like I said, it's gonna incrementally run every four hours, looks like or so. All right, so <clears throat> those are scanning rule sets. Um, let's talk a little bit about classifications. Um, again, this is these classifications are applied to your assets um, by default during scanning. So you can see these built-in classification rules, and these are how um, certain things are discovered in your data. So all sorts of stuff I've never heard of, a Canada Health Service number. You know, it's looking for all of these things as it scans your data. Um, you can also create custom classification rules. So for this demo, I created a, cl a custom classification rule called Twitter handle. And you can see it uses regular expressions to find Twitter handles in uh, the data. So the pattern it's looking for is a string that starts with the at symbol that's using uppercase and lowercase letters and numbers, and it's between five and 15 characters long. And then, so that's a that's a classification rule. Then we can create a custom classification that uses that rule. And then we can create a new scan, a custom scan. These are all the built-in scanners that are associated with specific data types or data source types. But I can create a custom scan rule set you know, so I've applied this Twitter scan rule set to a data lake storage account. And so when I scan using this custom um, rule set, it'll find uh, Twitter handles for me. So let's take a look at that. So we looked at the Azure SQL database. Let's look at the data lake storage here. We also have two scans here. We have the, uh, the built-in ADLS Gen 2 rule set that's scanned. We'll see how this one ran. It found 33 assets. The other one that uses the Twitter um, custom classification rule also completed and it discovered two assets that contained uh, Twitter handles. And that's, I think, the majority of what you would do here in the data map. Again, this is kind of the foundation. You define your, your sources, you define your scanning rules, and you define your classifications. And once that's done, you should be able to come back to the data catalog and view um, the data that's been found in the data map. This is, um, again, the home screen. We've got this search here. We have kind of a high level of what exists in Purview or what Purview is aware of. We have the ability to jump to the glossary, to browse some recently accessed stuff. Um, one thing a lot of people do here is you just use the star, search for everything basically. And now we see all of our assets um, found through our scans. So let's look at um, some of our assets here and we can look at a bit of lineage. So I mentioned the um, Azure SQL lineage. I have that scan on for that, that keeps track of lineage on that source uh test table so if i go to this asset i you know it just popped up there i didn't need to actually do the search um we see it's an azure sql table and we can see it's got three columns but we have this lineage tab here if we look at that it brings up <clears throat> this canvas here that shows how it's connected to other data um, that purview is aware of and we see the stored procedure that I created is also identified here. Um, it's important to note in the lineage view, the rectangular boxes indicate resource sets or assets that are that are usually like tables or data sources, whereas oval, um, you know, curved corners indicate processes. Um, so this is the stored procedure, and we see that this destination test table was created through that stored procedure. So that's the example of that preview feature using um, data lineage. 
let's look at some more lineage examples. Um, I mentioned that I have an Azure Data Factory um, registered or in our resource group. So let's take a look at this copy pipeline that I created. Um, this one's pretty basic. It's just taking two parquet tables that were identified in the Azure Data Lake uh, storage um, scan, queries by state and queries by country. You can see that they're both uh, data lakes. And we, we can click on one of these and get some more properties about it. Um, we can see here's the full path to it. We can see that it's um, in a folder. Um, see it's a TSV file here. But back to the lineage, we can see that it's used. And if we switch to this asset, we'll see that this copy activity copies from two sources and outputs a new data set called merged here. So that's pretty nice. And if you had a robust data estate, you would see a lot more here. These are just uh, basic examples. But I'd like to show you uh, more granularity that's possible um, with um, lineage, which I really like. And this is the granularity down to column or schema information. So I, in Data Factory, I also created a data flow. And you can see here, um, We've got an additional, uh, this is the button I want. We have an additional uh, slide out here that gives us access to our columns uh, and it's, it's defaulted to the output data sets. So I'm gonna select all the columns in this output data set. And you can see we have area code, number of customers and state province. So if I wanted to know where area code came from, I can, hover over area code, and you can see it also highlights phone over there on customer. So Purview is aware that this column area code was derived from the column phone. Um, so I think this is very powerful. Like I mentioned previously, this can be used for kind of look back analysis to say, you know, well, if something's wrong in this field, where, where does this field come from? You can come into Purview, look at the lineage and see, uh, you know, all the steps that a column like this went through. Um, also can be used for impact analysis, looking the other direction. So if, you know, we said we're gonna make a change to, you know, this column here, customer ID, we can see that that might affect this numcusts field out here. So I think that's a pretty nice feature um, within Purview. All right, let's look a little bit now at the glossary. We've got about 20 minutes left. I'd like to save a little bit of time for questions here. But let's go back to the data catalog and get into the glossary. And this is the same, the same this is where I took the screenshot for the uh, presentation, so nothing will look too different. Um, we have, again, all these terms. Terms can be uh, hierarchical. So these terms all have the parent term work analytics, whereas Contoso child has the parent Contoso parent here. They'll have different statuses. So you can uh, have a workflow associated with glossary terms. So if you're somebody who's responsible for defining business terms, you could create them in draft and move them through you know, until they're approved, some sort of workflow, whether it be completely manual or if it's a built-in workflow. And terms can also be expired, but still retained within the system, um, which I think is important for people to know the history of, of what terms used to be. And these terms can be um, associated with different assets. Right now, I only have one asset, uh, Contoso Child, that's associated with uh, an asset, one term that's associated with an asset. So I just associated this with uh, this uh, resource set, which is uh, this TSV file, queries by state. Um, so 
it, but it can be associated. You can associate these terms with anything. It uh, didn't. Uh, usually, you know, you define like sales or quarterly sales metrics like that, aggregation information, um, and associate those with different uh, tables or fields within your data estate. Um, I mentioned that there are different term templates. So most of these are using the default template with those eight built-in attributes. So let's look at one of these here. So we've got our formal name, our definition. There's no acronyms here for this one. Um, we've got related, so we've got synonyms. We've got two synonyms associated with this term, um, two related terms, and no children associated with this specific term. We've also got contacts. I've defined myself as an expert for most of these terms, as well as the steward for most of these terms. So you can uh, define these terms. And also to have an idea of the status of your overall glossary, the uh, data state insights, which I'll get to here in a second, uh, gives you a good overview of you know, how well you're doing with your glossary. You know, are there terms that are missing certain aspects or are in the alert state, stuff like that. So that's a good way to find some more information there. But you can also manage custom term templates. So this Contoso, te this Contoso child is using a custom template and you can see that here. It also has this additional attribute called <clears throat> business unit and it's assigned to marketing. So let's look at that term template. So here's the Contoso template that I created, and it's a single choice um, of business unit. And I've defined these possible choices. So when you're defining a term with that template, you'll be provided a drop down, and you'll select whether that term, you know, which uh, in this case business unit will that term be associated with. So. That's an example of how to use custom templates. All right, let's jump over to Data State Insights. Actually, before I go to Data State Insights, I want to mention Synapse. <clears throat> um, Synapse is a big component of a lot of data states on Azure. <clears throat> so I wanted to mention the purview integration with Synapse. Um, when you associate your purview workspace with your Synapse uh, workspace, you do so here through the Manage Blade. Um, you can see it's connected here. It will automatically extract information from your pipelines that are defined here, but it'll also give you um, the ability to search purview right from Synapse. So you don't even have to leave uh, Synap the Synapse workspace to gain access to your um, purview information, to your data catalog. So here, right, so I'm in Synapse here. I'm not in purview, but it looks like I'm in purview. So it's basically a wrapper for purview. We can see, um, you know, our assets that are defined in the catalog. Oh, and here's, I meant to get to this, the classifications. This is what they look like when they're applied. So um, this is a good example because this is the Twitter handles parquet file. We can see there was this column owner was automatically identified as a person's name with high confidence, but it also was classified this column, the account name as a Twitter handle. So that used my custom um, rule set there. So um, that's how you see classifications at the asset level. In this case, these are schema classifications. Remember. Um, classifications can be at the overall asset. Um, there are none at the asset level in this case, but there are two at the schema level. So it's just, I think it's cool that you can access this data from within uh, Synapse. All right, back to um, uh, one thing I didn't mention that's kind of related to Synapse and Data Factory is when you connect them, you don't need to continue to scan them. They will publish information from uh, pipelines and uh, yeah, from Synapse pipelines and Data Factory um, workflow, uh, pipe, Data Factory pipelines 
will send data to uh, Purview for you. So um, you don't need to scan those explicitly once they've been registered. All right, so let's look at the data state insights here briefly, and then we'll get to some questions. Um, this is that area where you can get that bird's eye view. <clears throat> Maybe you are the chief data officer or you're a data steward within an organization <clears throat> and you want to get metrics about how well you're doing within Purview. And you can see I'm not doing that well because um, it's just a demo environment. Um, <clears throat> You get these dashboards. I like the glossary dashboard <clears throat> here where you can see terms <clears throat> without assets, uh, terms with assets. You know, we only have one term with an asset, like I mentioned. So we've got all these other ones that aren't yet assigned to an asset. So then we can break them down here. And then we can also view details. So this is kind of that drill through. So we click on that and we're brought right to those asset, right to those uh, terms here and get some information about them and their current state. Um, sensitivity labels, nothing will be there. That's like I said, out of scope here, but um, some classification stuff, um, phone number, some things, how the classifications have broken down the automatic and custom classifications. So ultimately you want as much of your data classified as possible, so the, these dashboards will help you uh, get get there or identify where you need to spend more time. All right, um, got some time for questions. Um, let me. I'll just show you briefly. I'm going to open up the questions panel. There looks like some questions are in here. So, yep. Somebody said no sound. Okay, looks like Martha's dealing with that. Um, but in this uh, management section, um, this is where uh, you can set up those workflows. We talked about that preview feature. I'm not going to go through uh, setting those up, <clears throat> but that's where you can author workflows, monitor any requests or approvals that might come from workflows or view previous workflow runs that may have been triggered automatically. This is also where you define your credentials <clears throat> and um, metrics associated with uh, Purview are you see at the portal level. Um, so capacity units is what I mentioned here. You can see that I've been using one for the most part but it has bursted up to use three at certain times. All right. <clears throat> okay, good question. Um, somebody asked, do, does Purview have the option to scan on-prem tabular models? Um, we do have the capability to scan on-prem data sources as well as other cloud data sources. Um, and when we're scanning on-prem, we have the additional requirement of having a self-hosted integration runtime. Um, if you're familiar with Data Factory and Synapse, you're probably familiar with self-hosted integration runtimes. Um, one thing to note is these have to be separate. You can't dual use an existing uh, self-hosted IR. You have to provision another one. So. Um, Yes, on-prem data sources are supported. Another person asks, will the webinar be available after the live uh, session? Uh, yes, it will. Um, somebody asks um, if I can touch on the pricing model. Um, I'm not prepared to get into the pricing model uh, in today's webinar, um, but this is the uh, main metric associated with pricing is the data map capacity units. I can show you uh, from the demo how much um, this has cost. I'm using my, uh, let's see here.
and I've been using it for about a week or so, a little bit each day. Again, I'm not running regular scans, um, but previews come in at about $65 this month. Um, so not too bad, but again, I'm, I'm using a, only a few data sources and I'm not doing uh, very regular scheduled scans. All right, I'll wait a little bit for some more questions. Um, I think that's, I've addressed all the questions so far. <clears throat> okay, question about the statuses <clears throat> um, in the glossary. Um, the whether they are provided by Microsoft or if they are customizable. Um, as far as I know, they are pre-built. These are the existing statuses, and I'm not sure of a way to create additional statuses. Um, you could. There might be a way, I just don't know of it, um, but you could also use um, custom attributes, um, which are managed or managed attributes here. I mentioned this briefly in the preview features. So this could be an area that you create. Uh, I'm not sure if these can be applied to glossary terms. These are more applied to assets. Somebody's asking about sensitivity labels. Sensitivity labels can't be defined through this portal. This is the governance portal for purview. They can be a, a defined via the compliance portal, which again is outside the scope of this webinar. Um, again, that's related more towards the Microsoft 365 stuff. But once they are defined, um, you can view that information here. So let's let's do this here. <clears throat> it would show up here on the left, uh, right here in label. The the ones that it found in your data state would show up here as a as filterable. Um, but we don't have any um, here. Um, one question is, if Synapse is connected to Purview, is there a need to scan the data sources regularly? So the pipelines and the pipelines don't need to be scanned. So that's associated with lineage. Um, so like pipeline runs will automatically show up in the in the data catalog. But if you have a dedicated pool um, and data is loading in there outside of pipeline runs, um, or you have a data lake associated with Synapse, those assets would need to be scanned. Um, but the pipelines themselves are getting information into Purview without a scan. Um, okay, somebody asked about the product roadmap. I am not aware of a product roadmap that Usually Microsoft doesn't give dates. Um, I, I'm not aware of that uh, for Purview or really many other services. If you pay attention to the blog, uh, the official blogs, that's usually the best place to get information about new preview features. I don't have that link offhand, but if you just search for Microsoft Purview blog, you'll get to the Microsoft blog with the latest stuff there. Um, list of native connectors. Yeah, we can, we can find that. <clears throat> so 
So that's right here. Um, somebody was, I'm not sure if they were asking about specific. <clears throat> oh, Snowflake. Yeah, Snowflake is definitely on here. And it tells you which features are supported. So I mentioned like lineage is is, deport, is supported, you know, depending on which data source. So that's this column. So lineage is supported for Snowflake, but you can see like for Mongo, lineage is not supported. Okay, question back about the glossary. Okay, about the statuses in the glossary. <clears throat> question is, um, what makes something, or what triggers them to be expired or approved or you know changing of status? And so uh, by default, that's just done manually. So you'd go in, you would edit a term, and you would say, all right, this term meets some sort of uh, qualification and we would change it to approved here and hit save. Um, so that's the most basic way to update a status is manually and you would have different permissions within purview so that only certain people have the ability to perhaps approve glossary terms. Um, there's also workflows like I mentioned um, where you could say that once a term you know, meet certain criteria, it could automatically switch, something like that. Um, or once a new term is created in draft mode, it'll automatically send an email to the person who is responsible for maintaining the glossary, and they'll have to go in, review it, and then manually switch it to approved state. So that's kind of generally how um, they move through the different statuses. Um, so these are the two here, do a data access request, let's look at this, this is I think what I showed in the, uh, so in, in this case, this is that self-service uh, data access, is somebody says, hey, you know, I found this table within Azure Purview, I'm interested in, but I, in, in getting access to the data that's in that table, but I currently don't have it, they can submit an access request and it can uh, work through this workflow. This is just the template, but again, this can be changed. All right, well, we're at the end of our time today for our webinar. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, if you want some help uh, setting up Purview, reach out to Atmosera. We can definitely help you um, get started with best practices um or we can build it all for you and hand it off we also have the managed services so we can um, manage things like this if you need or anything else within azure really so um, again hope you enjoyed uh, the webinar and we'll see you next time